Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, before learned counsel proceeds to call witnesses, I would like to make a number of observations to you. The accused, Stephen Benson, has been charged with causing grievous bodily harm to William Parker. Having heard prosecuting counsel's opening address, it will be obvious to you that the alleged offence was committed inside Fulchester Prison. It will be equally obvious to you that at the time of the alleged offence, William Parker was a prison officer, and the accused was, indeed still is, serving a prison sentence for a previous offence. You will not allow these facts to colour your judgment. The accused is entitled to that same quality of justice which is everyone's right in this country. He is innocent until he is proved guilty. The jury consists of members of the public whose names appear on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. I call Juliet Walsh. Ms. Walsh, you are employed as a senior welfare officer at Fulchester Prison? Yes, I am. How long have you been employed in that capacity? At Fulchester Prison, three years. Prior to that, seven years in the probation service up and down the country. Just a moment. Benson, are yes, you handcuffed? Yes, my lord. Mr. Latimer, why is that man handcuffed? Well, I... I really don't know, my lord. Mr. Elliot? I have no idea, my lord. My client comes directly from Fulchester Prison. Uh, perhaps the prison officer with him can enlighten the court. Governor's orders, my lord. He thought it best. Did he now? Has Benson been handcuffed to you since leaving the prison? Yes. Unlock those things immediately. I will not have handcuffs used in this court. He's committed a very violent crime. That is for the jury to decide, not you or the prison governor. Now get them off. Yes, my lord. You may I sit down again, Benson. Thank you, my lord. Miss Walsh, you were telling Mr. Latimore that you have some ten years' experience in the prison service. Yes, my lord. Are such practices common? The handcuffs, my lord. Yes. When dealing with certain categories of prisoner, yes, my lord. Continue, Mr. Latimore. Thank you, my lord. Now, Miss Walsh, with regard to Stephen Benson, are you the welfare officer responsible for him at Fulchester Prison? Yes, I am. How long have you known him? Since he arrived at the prison, about yes. 18 months ago. Yes. Now, I cannot, of course, ask you about the offence that uh, led to the sentence which he is at present serving, but I would like to ask you why... If I may. Yes, Mr. Rowley. Uh, whilst complimenting my learned friend on the care with which he is observing the law, I would like to advise him that we have no objections to the, my client's previous convictions being made public during the course of this trial. Really, Mr. Elliot? You have, of course, considered the implications of such action? Oh, yes, fully, my lord. But uh, my client is most anxious that the jury have all the facts, and I endorse this view. We want nothing kept or held back from the jurors. I believe it was Edmund Burke who once observed that where mystery begins, justice ends. Yes, I see. <coughs> well, Mr. Latimer. Thank you, my lord. Ah, uh, Miss Walsh, uh, do you know the details of Benson's previous convictions? Yes, I do. Oh, would you give them to the jury, please? May I consult my case notes, my lord? Certainly, Miss Walsh. Uh, do you want his entire record or just his last offence? Well, I think, in view of my learned friend's remarks, we should have the entire record. At the age of 14, he was placed on probation for two years for stealing 14 and sixpence from a gas meter. At the age of 15, sentenced to three years at a remand home for breaking and entering and consequently breaching his probation order. He had on this occasion stolen goods to the value of seven pounds. At the age of 19, a two-year prison sentence for breaking and entering. This time he was caught on the premises. At the age of 24, sentenced to three years imprisonment for breaking and entering. Value of goods stolen, £83. Uh, this is the sentence he's currently serving. Thank you, Miss Walsh. Now, I should like to come now to certain events that occurred on the 27th of July this year. Today, 
that prison officer William Parker sustained serious injuries. Now, did you see the accused on that day? Yes, I did. He wanted me to help him write a letter. Well, could you elaborate on that answer? Stephen is illiterate. He has a girlfriend in London. They correspond regularly. As he can't read or write, he obviously needs help, and from time to time, I give it. Well, you say from time to time. Do I take it that others also assist him? Some of the inmates have helped him, though I'd hardly call what they do help. Why not? They think it's a great joke to doctor his letters. He'll say one thing, they'll write down something quite different. Yes, I see, but all letters, either from or to prisoners, are, of course, censored. Yes, Stephen has on several occasions been told to rewrite his letters because of the crude and objectionable content of them. Yes, these will be remarks written down by other prisoners under the guise of being helpful. Yes, exactly. Always sexual comments. Stephen has constantly complained to me about the censoring of his letters, and I gather he's also complained to the prison governor. Well, what were the nature of his complaints? Well, that there was nothing wrong with his letters, and that he was being victimised by a certain prison officer who, from time to time, performed the function of censor. Really? And did he voice such complaints to you on the 27th of July of this year? Yes, he did. He stormed into my office shouting, that bloody screw's taking diabolical liberties with me. I'm going to have him. I am going to have him. Really? Now, what do you think he meant by that remark? Yeah, my lord, and what the witness thought my client meant by that remark is not relevant, and I submit such evidence is inadmissible. I submit, my lord, that this is an expert witness. She is a welfare officer and a probation officer of considerable experience. Uh, some ten years of prisons and prisoners, I believe. My lord, and the witness is a welfare officer. Now, if she has qualifications in psychiatry or some other branch of mind reading, we have yet to hear. I submit that in this instance, the expert is not an expert. Rather harshly put, Mr. Elliot, but I'm inclined to agree with you. Thank you, Mr. Latimer, I feel that what Miss Walsh thought the accused meant by that alleged remark is not relevant, with the greatest respect. <coughs> Pray continue, Mr. Latimer. Well, as you wish, my lord. Nevertheless, Miss Walsh, did you hear those words? I am going to have him. Yes, I did. Well, do get on with it, Mr. Latimer. Yes, my lord. Now, did you ascertain what these diabolical liberties were, Miss Walsh? Yes. he just had another letter censored, and this time he'd been told to rewrite it because it contained threatening language. He was particularly distressed because he'd been sending a VO with the letter. Do you mean a, a visiting order, Miss Walsh? Yes, my lord. Yes, members of the jury, a male prisoner may normally receive a visit from a relation or friend once a month and the visitor must bring one of these visiting orders when coming to the prison. So, as well as the letter being stopped, the VO that accompanied that letter was also held back. That's right. I see. Now, could the witness be shown a copy of the letter? Exhibit 5. Copies, Mr. Latimer? Uh, of course, my lord. <clears throat> Should you wish, members of the jury, you may have copies of this when you retire to consider your verdict. <clears throat> My lord, I will, if my learned friend is agreeable, merely ask Miss Walsh to read the third paragraph of this letter. You have any objections to that, Mr. Elliot? No, none, my lord. She may read every dot and comma if my learned friend so wishes. Yes, Miss Walsh, is that the letter that Benson brought to you on the morning of the 27th of July? Yes, it is. Well, could you read the third paragraph out loud, please? And that nice Mr. Parker is really looking after me. Such a kind man and always smiling at me. I do hope nothing bad happens to him. You never know, some con might get a bit nasty and give him a seeing to. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing? Yes, thank you, Miss Walsh. Now, less than 30 minutes after you had read that threatening paragraph on the 27th of July, what happened? Alarm bells were ringing all over the prison. A full-scale riot was in progress. Prison officer Parker had been seriously injured. I contacted the assistant governor's office. Yes, now and don't tell us what you were told, but as a consequence of what you were told, what did you do? I went straight to the hospital wing. I saw prison officer Parker there. He was being attended to by a number of the hospital staff. He was unconscious, blood was pouring out of his head, and the staff told me... Yes, but you are not allowed to tell us what they told you. 
Now, how long did the riot in Fulchester Prison last? About five hours. <laughs> During that time, nearly a quarter of a million pounds worth of damage was done to the prison. Yes. Now, did you see the accused later that day? Yes, I did. I saw him in the prison governor's office shortly before he was returned to the solitary confinement block. Yes. Now, Miss Walsh, you stated earlier in your testimony that the accused thought he was being victimised by a particular prison officer who, from time to time, censored his letters. Now, did Benson name that particular officer? Yes, he did. It was prison officer William Parker. On the 27th of July, when the accused burst into your office declaring that he was going to have a bloody screw, did he name that particular bloody screw? He did. It was prison officer William Parker. How many inmates are there in Fulchester Prison on average? On average? Just over 700 men. Uh, when was the prison built? I believe it was completed in 1840. And have there been any major alterations or improvements since that date? In what way? Well, let me put it this way. When it was built a few years after Queen Victoria began her reign, how many men was the prison designed to hold? Well, a maximum of 350. Uh -huh. Since that time, has the accommodation been added to? No, it hasn't. So today, in a prison built for a maximum of 350 men, we now have <coughs> double that number. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the penologists in this country seem to be divided as to the main purpose of imprisonment. Uh, some consider its essential function is punishment, and others consider a rehabilitation the prime concern. Now, which of these do you endorse? Rehabilitation must be the prime concern. That also happens to be the official view. You mean the home office view? Yes. Now, I understand that as, uh, as part of this policy of rehabilitating the offender, there are evening classes within our prisons, further education where a prisoner can study a wide variety of subjects. That is correct. Now, will you please tell the court how many subjects are available in the evening classes in Fulchester Prison? Well, at the moment, none. Now, that, of course, is due to the recent riot. Well, no. There weren't any for a while before the riot. Well, how long is a while, Miss Wolfe? Two years. And what's the official reason for that? Shortage of facilities, shortage of instructors, government cutbacks in spending in the prison department. Now, the conciseness of that answer makes me feel that you've given it many times before. I have. Uh, tell me, Miss Walsh, the welfare department in Fulchester Prison, how many staff do you have? I'm in charge of the department. I have a staff of four. But that's, um, that's five of you to look after the welfare of 700 men? Yes. Would you say that was an adequate ratio? Hardly. Mm -hmm. Staff at prison with the same number of inmates has twice that number of welfare officers. So it would be fair to say then that you're under constant and excessive pressure, that you're overextended? Yes, we are. Now, is that why during the 18 months that Stephen Benson has been incarcerated, neither you nor any member of your staff nor any member of the prison service has made any attempt whatsoever to rehabilitate him? My Lord, oh, no, I must I... protest this line of questioning. Miss Walsh is here to give specific evidence. <laughs> Not to defend herself or any other member of the staff at Fulchester Prison. Uh, my lord, would you hear me on this? Certainly. In his opening statement to the jury, my learned friend dwelt at great length on the recent riot in Fulchester Prison. A riot, if we are to accept the prosecution contention, caused as a direct result of the alleged assault by my client on Officer Parker. Now, is it not crucial to the issue to discover the facts that led up to this riot? to discover what actual conditions prevailed within the prison. A prison is a closed society within our own open society, but surely it's governed by the same laws. I have no desire to harass this witness, but we must obtain from her an accurate picture of the prison. It seems perfectly reasonable to me, Mr. Latimer. As you wish, my lord. Thank you, my lord. Now, uh, you were telling the court how overworked and understaffed your welfare department is, and I put it to you that during the 18 months that Benson has been in prison, no attempt whatsoever has been made by anyone, be it a member of your staff, the prison service, or anyone else, to rehabilitate that man. What are you implying? That it's my department's fault that he's in the dock? I imply nothing, Miss Walsh. I'm asking a direct question. I've asked it twice, and I'm still waiting for an answer. I can well understand your hesitation. Look, we do what we can for them. It is very little. But the fact that it is very little is not my department's fault. You must get someone from the Home Office into this witness box and ask them why it is so little. 
You must get someone from the prison department into this witness box and ask them why they are obsessed with prison security. Ask them why my department in Fulchester Prison is treated with either indifference or hostility by the bulk of prison officers. Our problem is not in contacting the inmates. It's in trying to establish contact with the rest of the staff. Well, this problem of the censorship of Benson's letters, did you take this up with the governor? Yes, indeed I did, on several occasions, with no success. Well, I suppose that's something. Miss Walsh, thank you, you've been most helpful. My lord. Yes, thank you, Mr. Latimer. <coughs> Miss Walsh, you have testified how, on the day that prison officer William Parker was attacked, you saw the accused half an hour before the riot in Fulchester Prison. Yes, my lord. Now, as I understand it, the movement of prisoners is strictly controlled. Was he accompanied by an officer? Oh, no, my lord, by a red band. A red band. A red band, ladies and gentlemen, is another convict placed in a position of trust. And was the accused then returned to his workshop? Yes, my lord, workshop three. Do you know where this riot broke out, where it began? Yes, it broke out in workshop three. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Walsh. You may leave the witness box. Thank you. I call Dr. Graham Chapman. Yes. Acting on a request from the Home Office, I have in the past month carried out uh, an examination both on prison officer William Parker and the accused Stephen Benson. Yes. Well, if we may deal firstly with Mr. Parker, Doctor. May I refer to these, my lord? Certainly, Dr. Chapman. Uh, yes, on July 27th, Mr. Parker was admitted to the intensive care unit of Fulchester General Hospital. He had sustained a blow to the back of the head and there was heavy external bleeding. Uh, further examination at the time by specialists and subsequently by myself confirmed that he suffered a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, this was caused by a latent condition known as berry aneurysm. Uh, the external injury is well on the way to being healed. But the subarachnoid hemorrhage has left Mr. Parker partially paralysed and with very severe mental defects. Yes, well, now, if we might break that down into lay terms, Doctor, I would be most grateful. Uh, certainly, yes. Well, prior to his injury, Mr. Parker had a condition where certain blood vessels in his brain were under pressure and likely to burst spontaneously at any time. Uh, this condition, which would have been unknown to him, is termed berry aneurysm. Now, all the men medical evidence suggests that, uh, in this particular case, a blow to the head precipitated the bursting of an artery. Now, the chances of a total recovery are virtually nil. And Mr. Barker is now reduced virtually to a living vegetable. Yes. Yes, I see. Now, turning to the accused, will you tell my lord and the jury your conclusions after your examination of him? <laughs> my lord, Dr. Chapman's full report is already entered as an agreed exhibit, number seven, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Latimer. Uh, mental tests which I carried out on the accused Stephen Benson, uh, involving educational training, training, show him to be just above the level of a feeble-minded person. He is illiterate, but tests which don't involve the use of literacy give him a mental age of about 13 years. However, in my opinion, I think his present low intelligence is an educational defect rather than any innate defect. Verbally, in many areas, he's very bright. Yes, but under the definitions of the Mental Health Act, he is fit to stand trial. Oh, yes, certainly. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, very much. Doctor, initially, I'd like to ask you about Mr. Parker. Now, did you say that prior to July the 27th, he was suffering from a condition known as berry aneurysm? Yes. A condition where certain blood vessels in his brain were likely to burst spontaneously at any time. Yes, that's right. Oh, can you be absolutely sure that his present condition, I believe my learned friend referred to it as that of a living vegetable, can you be sure that this was caused by a blow to his head on July the 27th? Well, in a case like this, it's very difficult to be absolutely certain. But all the medical evidence suggests that, in this case, his present condition was triggered off by that blow to the head. Would this blow have to be a severe one? Oh, no, no, certainly not. No, a slight knock or a bang, or as I've already indicated, his existing condition was such that it could have happened on its own automatically. But uh, I don't believe in this particular case that he did. 
You see, if you, if you imagine that that particular artery was rather like the inner tube of a bicycle wheel, but an inner tube with a defect, weakened, uh, ready to burst at any moment, uh, I believe that, that the blow he received punctured the tube. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, the, uh, the bursting of these blood vessels, now could it be that they occurred spontaneously without any blow to the head and that the external injury was caused when Officer Parker collapsed to the floor hitting the back of his head afterwards? Yes, certainly that could have been the sequence of events. Well, so then we could be dealing with an accident, an act of God as it were. Yes, but as I understood it, uh, there was clear evidence that he'd been hit on the back of the head with a hammer. Evidence? What evidence? No hammer has been entered as an exhibit. Have you examined this hammer? Has it been to forensics? Workshop three, where the alleged attack took place, was virtually destroyed in the riot that followed the attack. There was a very big fire. Any evidence that might have existed was destroyed in the fire. Might have existed. Thank you, Doctor. You've been most helpful. Uh, my Lord, do I take it that my learned friend does not wish to cross-examine the doctor regarding the medical report on his client? It would appear not, Mr. Latimer. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Chapman. Dr. Chapman, you're free to go. Thank you, my Lord. I call Bernard Axton. Bernard Axton? I'm a Catholic. Please take the Dewey Biden and read aloud the words from the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I give shall be the truth, the old truth, nothing but the truth. You are Bernard Axton? I am, sir. What is your occupation, Mr. Axton? I'm a prison officer at Fulchester Establishment, sir. Establishment? Yes, sir. My, uh, Lord, I understand that the officers commonly refer to prisons as establishments. Do they, indeed? Can't think why. How long have you been in the prison service? Uh, just over 15 years, sir. And how long have you been at Fulchester Prison? I've been with that particular establishment uh, just on 10 years, sir. Uh, yes. Now, were you on duty on the 27th of July, the day of the riot? I was, sir. Now, I'd like you to tell my lord and the jury, in your own words, what happened at 11.34am. I was having a cup of tea with fellow officer Turner in the PO's office when that particular alarm bell rang. Yes, sir. Mr. Axton, I appreciate that you and your fellow officers have your own particular jargon, but I don't believe we have any prison officers actually on the jury. Who or what is a PO? It's a principal officer, sir. You see, starting at the bottom, you've got your ordinary officers, then your SOs, your senior officers, and then your POs, then you've got your, your chief officers, then your assistant governors, then you've got your governors, you see. Yes, thank you for the information, Mr. Axon. You're sure you haven't left anyone out? No, I don't think so, sir. But the hospital staff, they have a different form of structure. Yes, well, I don't think we'll bother with that, unless, of course, Mr. Latimore, you feel that it's relevant. Not at all. No, I'll do. Sir. Let's get on with it. Yes, well, it is. Now, Mr. Axon, you were having tea with Officer Turner when the first alarm bell went. That's what I said, sir. The PO sent Turner and me round there uh, while he fought for some more men to join us. Yes, now, how long did it take you to get there? Only a few minutes, sir. We ran all the way to the workshop. Yes, and what was the scene that confronted you? Well, the men were by the benches. Some working, some just sitting there. All except one. All except that little bastard there. He was kneeling beside my friend Bill Parker. Bill was on the floor unconscious, out cold. There was blood all over the place. And that little runt, that little runt was kneeling beside him with a hammer in his hands. Join us tomorrow when the case of the Queen against Benson will be resumed in the Crown Court.
Stephen Benson is charged with having assaulted a prison officer while serving a sentence in Fulchester Prison. The jury is selected from members of the public whose names appeared on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. At the end of yesterday's hearing, prison officer Axton lost his temper in the witness box. Mr. Axton, I would remind you that you are still under oath and I must ask you today to moderate your language. Uh, yes, my lord. But you see, Bill Parker, he was a very good friend of mine. He's a good man. He's a good officer, too. And now, look at him, he's no use to anybody. He just sits there in a hospital bed, staring into space. And all because of that... Look! Look at him grinning! He's grinning! All because of that little runt there! Mr. Axton, I'm sure you wish to see justice done in this case. You bet I do, sir. Well, justice will be <coughs> best served if you give your evidence calmly without abusing Benson. I will have no histrionics in this court. Do I make myself clear? Yes, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Lathmore. Thank you, my lord. Now, Mr. Axton, you were telling us at the end of yesterday's hearing that when you and Officer Turner ran into workshop three, the accused was kneeling beside the unconscious body of William Parker. That's right, sir. With a hammer in his hands. There was blood everywhere. What did you do? Well, I told Turner to go forth for some more men to join us while I dealt with Benson. I grabbed hold of him, hustled him outside, and he was taken immediately to the segregation block, sir. Who by? By me, sir. I see. What did you then do? I returned immediately to workshop three, sir. Fellow officers were trying desperately to deal with the prisoners under fire. The whole place was ablaze, sir. A full-scale riot was in progress, sir, and it got a lot worse, too. Yes, well, I don't think we wish to deal with the escalation of the riot in this court, Mr. Axton. Really, Miss Latimer, why not? My lord, a full inquiry into the riot is at present being held by a special committee appointed by the Home Office. I see. That will not prevent Mr. Elliot from asking this witness questions about the events in Workshop 3 where this riot is alleged to have begun, will it? Well, of course not, my lord. I might have a few to ask myself. Uh, as you wish, my lord. Continue, Mr. Latimer. Yes. Um, yes, I... Uh, I will. My lord, uh, Mr. Axon, at that moment when you entered the workshop, most of the men were at their benches working. That's right, sir. Or going through the motions of work, as they usually do. Yeah, my lord, I listen with distaste to the growing subjectivity in this witness's evidence. Now, may he be asked to confine himself to answering just the questions? Mr. Axton, I appreciate that you feel deeply about this matter, but this trial is a search for the facts and not opinions. Not, that is, unless they be expert opinions. I'm much obliged to your lordship. Uh, Mr. Axton. Mr. Axton. Sir. Mr. Axton, you were telling the court that w the men were at their benches working when you and Officer Turner entered workshop three. That's right, sir. Well, except Benson. He was kneeling beside Bill Parker with the hammer still in his hands. Did the accused say anything when he saw you? No, he just looked a bit nervous and backed away, so I grabbed hold of him and took him outside. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Axton. Do you sometimes act as censor of the prisoner's letters? Hey? What's that got to do with this case? Mr. Axton, I will judge the relevance of the questions, and I would like you to answer that question. Yes, sir. All right, I do. What about it? From time to time, you have censored Benson's letters. Is that correct? You mean 2119840, Benson? Mr. Axton, in this courtroom, here's not a number. Now, do you, or have you, from time to time, censored Stephen Benson's mail? Yes, I do. Thank you. I'd like to put to you some of the reasons you've given for rejecting his letters and ordering him to rewrite them over the past 18 months. Well, you can put what you like, sir, but I shan't answer your questions. Why not? Official Secrets Act, sir. All that information is covered by the Official Secrets Act. Don't you talk to me about the Official Secrets Act. This man faces a serious charge and you lecture me about the bloody Acts of Parliament. Mr. Elliot. Sorry, my lord. It's an accident. I'm fully aware that in ordinary circumstances you would not be permitted to answer such questions. That's right, my lord. However, these are not ordinary circumstances. I direct you, as I will, if necessary, direct any subsequent witnesses to answer any questions I consider relevant in this trial. If necessary, I shall clear the court and the trial will proceed in secret. But I will not brook any interference with the course of justice. Over the years, I've grown weary of listening to civil servants talking about matters not being in the public interest and hiding behind the Official Secrets Act, it will not happen in this trial. You will, unless I direct you not to, answer counsel's questions. Is that understood? Yes, my lord. So you're right then, mate. <laughs> you are coming very, very close to committing contempt of court. 
I'm not prepared to predict what sentence I might inflict upon you should I find you guilty of contempt. Let me point out to you that one of the possibilities is imprisonment. I'm, uh, I'm very sorry, my lord. Thank you, my lord. Now, Mr. Axton, as I understand the prison system on censorship, uh, if, when acting as censor, you want a prisoner to rewrite a letter, the letter is passed from you to the governor with your comments on it. Is that correct? Yes, that's right, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, over the past 18 months, with regard to letters written by the accused, have you stopped his letters for the following reasons? Uh, five for using grossly improper language. Well, I can't remember the exact number, sir, but that figure would be about right, yes. One, because he mentioned he was getting his letters stopped. One that contained complaints about the quality of the food. One that made critical comment about the censorship of his letters. One written in an attempt to get a pen friend. And one because it was written in red ink. Did you get all those letters stopped for those reasons? If you say so, sir. No, I'm not saying so. I'm asking you. Well, I can't be precise. I sent her a lot of letters, but I'd certainly have stopped any letters for the reasons you've just given. Why? Contravention of prison rules. What, writing a letter in red ink? Certainly. Definitely not allowed. You see, you must understand, sir, that allowing a prisoner to write a letter is a privilege. Well, is it not a basic human right? It's a privilege, sir, and those privileges can be removed. What do you believe to be the purpose of prison? To punish. People go in there because they've broken laws, committed crimes. What about rehabilitation, making them better people? <laughs> oh, in most cases, it's a complete waste of time. Complete waste of time. The best thing to do is to make it as hard and as unpleasant for them as possible. To discourage them from committing further crimes when they get out. They've got to be taught a lesson. Or oh, is that what you decided to do to the accused when you ran into workshop three? What do you mean? Teach him a lesson. No, is that why you took the course of action that you did? I just got him out of there as quick as I could. I put it to you, you did a lot more. I put it to you that the first thing you did was to hit him over the head with your truncheon. And when he fell to the floor, you kicked his body. Not once, but again and again. Indeed, kicking him until he was unconscious. I would also put to you that the sole cause of the prison riot that followed was the violent and brutal beating that you inflicted upon that young man. It's nonsense. Utter nonsense. I didn't beat him up. Well, how much force did you use on him then? I used no more force than was necessary. <laughs> yes, yeah. Good old rule 4-4. Four -four. What is that, uh, Mr. Elliot? That's prison rule number 44, my lord. I would like at this point to introduce a copy of the prison rules if, uh, as an exhibit, if my learned friend has no objections. Uh, none, my lord. No, <laughs> will come exhibit 9. Thank you, my lord. Uh, Usher. Would you give a copy of the prison rules to Mr. Axton? I'm sure you're familiar with the prison rules, Mr. Axton, but you may wish to refresh your memory, and I have no desire to take an unfair advantage. I'm quite familiar with Rule 44, sir. An officer, when dealing with a prisoner, shall not use force unnecessary, but when the application of force to a prisoner is necessary, then no more force than is necessary shall be used. That's excellent. It's very good, Mr. Axton. Uh, I wonder if you could also recite for us Clause 2 of that rule. Clause 2? Yeah. Um, it's right there. Oh, yes. Find the bloody thing there. Uh, no officer shall act deliberately in a manner to provoke a prisoner. Yes. Now, on your sworn testimony, when you enter the workshop, all the men except one were at their benches, either working or, as you so memorably put it, going through the motions of work like they usually do. Now, on your sworn testimony, it was you that moved towards Benson. It was you that grabbed him and dragged him outside. Is that correct? That's right, sir. Then what sparked the riot that immediately followed your action? I mean, what caused a full-scale riot that has cost us an estimated quarter of a million pounds? Benson attacking Bill Parker. But, Axton, if that was so, surely you would have entered the workshop to find the riot in progress. Well, it happened a few minutes later. Mm, indeed it did. Uh, but on your testimony, you've stated that the only thing that took place in those few minutes was you grabbing Benson and taking him outside. Yes, that's right. <laughs> well, I put it to you that it was not Benson's attack on your friend that caused the riot, but your attack on Benson. I suggest that every man in that workroom knew you had brutally attacked an innocent man, and that is what precipitated the prison riot. My lord, the witness can hardly be expected to know what was in the minds of some 30 prisoners at any given moment. I agree, Mr. Latimore. As your lordship pleases. 
Uh, when, you, um, when you took Benson outside, you took him directly to the segregation block. Mm -hmm. What is this segregation block? Well, it's a fancy term for what you used to call the punishment block, sir. Solitary confinement. Oh, so he was taken to a punishment, sir? That's right, sir. Uh, did he go quietly? <laughs> well, it didn't cause me any trouble, if that's what you mean. Mm, because he was unconscious when you dragged him there? Nonsense. I walked him there. Well, did you meet or see any of your brother officers on the way? I don't remember seeing anyone. The place was in utter chaos. You know, bells ringing, people shouting eyes. Mm, how convenient. Now, how near is the punishment block to Workshop 3? Oh, not far. A couple of hundred yards away, that's all. How long was it before you returned to Workshop 3? Just a few minutes. And in those few minutes, you'd have us believe that a full-scale riot had broken out. Hmm? The workshop was ablaze. Your fellow officers were trying to control both the fire and the prisoners. That's about it. I suggest that when you got the accused to the punishment cell, he had recovered consciousness. And when you got him into the cell, you gave him another beating before you returned to workshop three. That Parker lies. Parker was a close friend, was he not? He was. A good officer, too. And good when man. You went, and when you went to the workshop and saw, or thought you saw, the accused attacking your friend, you lost your temper. I mean, here was this man. What was it, what was it you called him? A little bastard. A little runt. Well, here was this little bastard, this runt with a hammer in his hands. And I suggest that it was you that initiated the violence with a vicious attack on young Benson. It's lies. It's all lies! So, Mr. Teller, you followed your colleague Axton into workshop three. Yes, I did. Everything appeared to be normal, except that Officer Parker was lying on the floor unconscious. There was blood pouring from his head, and kneeling beside him was the prisoner Benson. Yes, now, can you recall where Benson was kneeling in relation to Parker's body, that is? By the officer's head. I see. By the officer's head. Yes, that's right. And what, if anything, was in Benson's hand? One of the hammers that they use in that particular workshop. I see. Now, would you tell us, in your own words, what happened next? It was obviously a very serious incident, so I phoned the chief officer directly. Yes, now, did you see your colleague Axon dealing with the accused? No. I was too intent on getting through to the chief. By the time I'd got through and informed the situation, Benson and Axton were on their way out. Somebody had started a fire. A whole pile of mailbags and materials was flaring up, and the workshop was rapidly filling up with smoke. Excuse me, my lord. May I question the witness? Question the witness? Yes. What did you want to ask him? I wanted to ask him about that hammer, my lord. What about the hammer? When he entered this workshop and saw the accused kneeling on the floor, how was he holding the hammer? Do you mean by which end was he holding it? No, my lord. I mean, was he holding it in a threatening manner or not? That's a very good question. Well, Mr. Turner, can you enlighten the juror? As I recall, it was lying on the floor and his hand was touching or, or just holding the handle. So he was not poised as if to strike the prison officer? No, my lord. Thank you, my lord. My lord, uh, you were telling us, Mr. Turner, that the workshop was on fire. Yes, uh, I tried to calm the men down, but they appeared to be enraged. They kept calling out that Benson hadn't done anything. Yes, now, have you ever had any trouble with Benson? Well, there was one occasion earlier this year. Uh, I'd had to stop one of his letters and he threatened me. Oh, really? Now, what happened? Oh, he, he raised his fist. Uh, I just told him not to be bloody silly or I'd put him on report. I see. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Turner, how long have you been in the prison service? Nearly two years. And is this, is this the first riot condition you've seen in that time? Yes, it is. I take it that your prison officer training course would have been at the customary place Wakefield? Yes, it was. And how long is that course? Eight weeks. Uh, would I be correct in assuming that the basic theme of that course is one of containment of the prisoners? I wouldn't agree that it's the basic theme of the course, but obviously that aspect features heavily. Uh, Mr. Tanner, what are the basic qualifications needed before one becomes a prison officer? Well, uh, you're given various tests and extensive interviews. Yeah, uh, these various tests and interviews, I am right in saying, am I not, that they take place in the course of just two days? You mean before you're offered a job? Yes, I do. Yes. Uh, of course, then you have to be trained at Wakefield, and, and the training doesn't stop there. You're learning all the time. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you are, but without any basic educational qualifications, such as degrees, A-levels, O-levels. I mean... A man can find himself in some measure of control over prisoners within just 
four months of joining the prison service. Yes, I think that would be accurate. Now, what do you consider to be the prime purpose of prison? Rule one of the prison rules answers that question clearly. The purpose of the training and treatment of convicted prisoners shall be to encourage and assist them to lead a good and useful life. It's an admirable sentiment. But do you think it can be applied to the day-to-day -day life of Fulchester Prison or indeed any other prison? No, it can't. Why not? What we have in our prisons is a myth, a fantasy of rehabilitation. Men like Benson cutting up mailbags to salvage the metal rings. Young prisoners working on farms and then returning to ghetto areas in big cities like London, Liverpool, Birmingham. You don't find many farms in those places. We're not all punitive-minded in the prison service, you know. A lot of us want to help these people. We'd like to take over the welfare work. They won't let us. Please, please go on. The Prison Officers Association put forward a scheme four years ago proposing the incentive of an extra sixth remission of sentence for prisoners of good behaviour. Such a scheme would have reduced the prison population by 25%. It was rejected. Consequently today, right now, there are over 42,000 people serving prison sentences. Over 1,100 of them are serving life. And of those, more than 120 have done 10 years or more. The courts keep handing out longer and longer sentences. Many of our prisons are bursting at the seams. The, the really violent, dangerous criminals, instead of being contained in one large maximum security prison, are scattered all over the country. Consequently, the rotten apples contaminate the others. Oh, what's, what's the government doing about this? <laughs> In April this year, the government decreed that the prison service, which is 20% understaffed, should save £2 million on overtime hours. Now, now, Fulchester, like every other prison, runs on overtime. Whole prison suffered a cutback of 800 man-hours per week. Now, those cuts at Hull, as at every other prison in the country, meant less time out of the cells for the men, less visits, Less association with other prisoners, less evening classes. This September, there was a riot at Hull Prison. The estimated damage in that one riot is precisely the amount the government is trying to save per annum in prison service costs. Two million pounds. I, I don't know where the book stops, but if it doesn't stop soon, the recent riots we've had in this country at Fulchester, Hull, Gartry, Albany, they'll look like picnics with what's to come. Mr. Taylor, I'm sure we're all obliged for that disturbing information. Screws aren't all bastards, you know. No. No. I take it then it is your belief that some of these factors you've told us about caused the riot in Fulchester Prison, in your opinion? I believe so, yes. Apart from the incident you've mentioned, have you ever had any trouble with the accused? Apart from that incident, no. Have you ever seen him use violence? No. Mr. Turner, I thank you. Mr. Hudson, are you at present serving a prison sentence at Fulchester? Yes, sir, I am. Yes. And in, in July this year, were you sharing a cell with the accused? Yes, sir, with Benson. Yes. Now, during that period, was any mention made by Benson regarding Officer Parker? Oh, yes, sir. Benson had a real bee in his bonnet about Officer Parker. He felt that uh, Parker was picking on him. Kept saying to me that he was going to get Parker and give him a good hiding. I, you know, tried to tell him that he would only get into trouble, but he wouldn't listen. Kept saying he was going to have Parker. The night before the riot, Benson really did his nut. When we were banged up for the night, he told me that Parker had stopped another one of his letters and that uh, this one had a VO in it for his girlfriend. He was really mad. See, his girl was the only one who ever visited him and she had to come all the way from London. Anyway, he, uh, he said that he was going to, you know, sort it all out the next day and if he didn't get any satisfaction, he was going to do Parker. And I asked him, you know, I, I said, uh, 
how are you going to do him? And he said, with a bleeding hammer. Yeah, really? Now, are you absolutely certain, beyond any doubt whatsoever, that those are the words that Benson used the night before Officer Parker was attacked? Yes, sir. I'm quite certain he said that. He said a lot more besides. Did he now? Well, you are under oath. Would you please tell my lord and the jury what else your cellmate Benson said? Well, you know, I, I tried to calm him down. I told him that he was only making trouble for himself and that if he didn't watch out, they'd have him in front of the governor and stick him in the chokey. In the chokey? <coughs> oh, that's the segregation block, my lord. They, uh, they call it the chokey. Do they indeed? Carry on, Mr. Lennon. My lord. Now, what was his response? I mean, when you warned him? Well, he said he didn't care. He said he was sick and tired of Parker getting at him and that he was going to teach Parker a lesson. Yeah. Now, was there any further conversation? Oh, yes, a lot. I don't remember all of it. I, I, I can remember saying, you know, that Parker was a big man and, and that he might give Benson a scene too. And Benson said, not after I've hit him on the head with a hammer, he won't. I'll crack his head like an egg. You, no, 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 somebody stop me. Did it back in the ah. Stop that. Leave that man alone. Benson, I must warn you against such outbursts in this court. I will not tolerate them. In good time, you will have ample opportunity in the witness box to question this witness's evidence. Until then, you will remain silent. Is that clear? Sorry, my lord. I lost my head. Will that prison officer please stand? What is your name? Officer Layton, my lord. Was it necessary to use that degree of violence on the accused? Oh, my lord, I told you at the beginning of the case, he's a violent man. That's why I had him handcuffed. I will not tolerate any violence in this court from any source. But, my lord, I'm responsible for his safekeeping. Then keep him safe, but unharmed. Yes, my lord. I propose to adjourn for the day. Usher, will you please see that... Benson receives first aid from the court staff immediately. All stand. The cases in Fulchester are fictitious. Tomorrow you can join us again when the Queen against Benson will be concluded in the Crown Court. Stephen Benson is charged with having assaulted prison officer William Parker whilst serving a sentence in Fulchester Prison. The jury in this case has been selected from members of the public whose names appeared on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. Yesterday, fellow prisoner Hudson testified about the threats that the accused, Stephen Benson, had made on the night prior to the prison riot. Hudson is about to be cross-examined. I understand that you're serving a seven-year prison sentence, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's right. <clears throat> and what offence were you found guilty of? It was a sexual offence. <clears throat> Would you please direct your answer to the jury, please? It was a sexual offence involving a young woman. Oh, Hudson, it was hardly a young woman. I have no wish to embarrass you about that offence. It is not my intention to retry your case in this court, but it is essential that I ask you certain questions. Now, it was a sexual offence involving a nine-year-old child, was it not? Yes, it yes. was. Now, in cases like yours, I understand the practice is for prison authorities to segregate such offenders. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And why do they do that? 
to stop us getting beaten up by the other prisoners, to protect us from the more virtuous criminals, you know, murderers, people who shoot bank guards yes. and the like. Yes, yes, but on the night prior to this alleged assault on Officer Parker, you were sharing a cell with Benson. Now, he's not a sex offender. Why were you in that cell with him? Well, they didn't have enough room in the wing where they keep cases like mine. They put me in with Benson. It was about a month before the riot. He was considered harmless. Harmless? Hmm? And was he harmless? How do you mean? Well, did he ever beat you up or threaten you with violence? No, no, but I could, I could tell he wasn't happy about sharing with me. Could you? Now, this conversation that you alleged you had with Benson in which he threatened to crack Parker's head with a hammer, do you have any witnesses to this? Yes. They'd put another prisoner in our cell just a few days before the riot. He was there. Well, then doubtless he will be able to confirm your evidence. Well, I don't know about that. One Mr. Anthony Mills, I believe. Well, we shall hear from him shortly. Now, Mr. Hudson, you are eligible for parole, are you not? Yes. And with some luck, you could be a free man shortly after this trial. Yes. Did someone do a deal with you? Did someone say something like, look, you're sweating on your parole. Now, if you choose to be cooperative about this assault on Parker, it could make your parole chances a lot easier. Now, was something like that said to you? I went to see the governor voluntarily. Nobody told me to go. I call Arthur John Humphreys. And I've been prison governor at Fulchester for four years now. Yes, now, Mr. Humphreys, the suggestion has been made during this trial that a deal was done with the witness Hudson, that it was intimated to him that if he gave damaging testimony against the accused, he, Hudson, might get his parole. Now, as I understand the parole system, the only member of a prison staff who can affect a parole is the governor himself. That's right, yes. Yeah. Right. Now, did you do a deal with Hudson? I've never done a deal with a prisoner for a slice of bread, let alone an issue as grave as this. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Humphreys. Now, prior to the alleged assault on Officer Parker, had the <coughs> accused, to your knowledge, committed any acts of violence? Uh, not in my prison, no, but during his previous sentences, there are two incidents recorded where he threatened prison officers. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Humphreys. <coughs> Mr. Humphreys, you have some ten years' experience of the prison service. Yes, I do. At a number of prisons? Yes. Uh, my lord, anticipating that there may be objections from a learned friend, I would like to advise him that I intend to question this witness not merely about the conditions within Fulchester Prison, but conditions throughout the prison service. It is my desire that the jury should be able to set the specific against the general. I see. Do you have any objections to that line of questioning, Mr. Lattimore? Oh, well, that's all, my lord. I would like to think that uh, in this trial both councils have conducted themselves with complete fairness. Of course, it is not Fulchester Prison in particular, nor indeed the prison service in general that is on trial, but I have no objections if my learned friends wishes to wander abroad. I'm much obliged. Ah, uh, Mr. Humphreys, I understand that Fulchester Prison was built in 1840. Mm -hmm. it must be the oldest still in use in the country. Oh, good Lord, no. Dartmoor was built to house prisoners from the Napoleonic Wars, and they're still using it. Uh, Durham was built in the uh, early 1800s, Parkhurst 1830, Winston Green and Lewis were both completed in 1853, and there are over 30 prisons still in use today that were built before the First World War. Are they all as overfull as yours? Well, it varies. Some of them are. Uh, uh, Winston Green, for example. The normal accommodation there should be for a maximum of uh, 596. Now, you'll find over 800 there at this minute. Now, I understand that the prison population is at its highest ever figure. Presumably, then, all of our prisons are over full. No. Uh, some, like uh, Grendon Underwood, for example, are half empty. Others have been closed during the past few years. I can think of <coughs> oh, six that have been closed during the past two years. But why close some and keep others half empty when prisons like yours are bursting at the seams? Oh, I gather the uh, experts have some difficulty predicting prison population trends. And by experts you mean civil servants at the Home Office? Yes. Some of them. Yes. Now, is it not a fact that because they have in the past few years experienced such difficulties, some uh, two and a half million pounds of public money was wasted because prison building projects put in hand were subsequently scrapped? Yes, that's right. Now, what does it cost to keep an inmate in custody? £78 pounds per week. That's 78. Uh, per person, per week. 
Uh, Mr Humphreys, the accused is illiterate. Now, in that respect, is he unique as far as Fulchester prison is concerned? Oh, I wish he was. Uh, my staff estimate that one in five of the inmates needs remedial training. But that's, that's approximately 140 men in your prison alone who are illiterate. Yes. Well, now, evidence, evidence has been given that there have been no evening classes in your prison for the past two years. What's the reason for that? Not enough facilities, not enough money, not enough staff. Now, I'd be happy to organise evening classes if you could persuade the government to spend the money. Money? Well, talking of money, how much do we spend each year on prisons and how much on, say, the probation service? Uh, on prisons, £150 million, pounds, which is five times what we spend on probation. Five times. A workshop three, exactly what kind of work is done there? Metal recovery, that's dismantling old post office equipment. Uh -huh. What wage do the men in that workshop earn? Uh, 60 pence a week. How many hours per week do they work? 26, which is the national average in prisons. The target is 40 hours per week, but there's not, I believe, a single prison in the country where this target is achieved. Now, the main reason for this disparity is shortage of prison officer staff. Mm. The work that they do in this particular workshop, would you say that it was designed to help their rehabilitation? No. The main priority is to give them something to do. Anything. Well, tell us, what is the main form of work within our prisons? Domestic service. Cleaning. Cleaning? But, Mr Humphreys, I am right, am I not, that the prison rules state quite clearly that the purpose of the training and treatment of convicted prisoners shall be to encourage and assist them to lead a good and a useful life. Rule one, yeah. Yes. Well, tell me, is there... Is there any machinery for consultation between the prison department and the, uh, the TUC and the CBI for, to seek more, well, better areas of work for these people? Yes, yes, there is, but I'm afraid I can't give you details of those meetings. Why not? Well, the meetings are held in secret and the minutes are never published. I can't think why there's all this secrecy. I gather it's considered to be a sensitive area, my lord. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a riot-torn prison. Uh, Mr. Humphreys, apart from the censorship problem, what kind of prisoner was the accused? He's never been on report in my prison. He's never been on report. Thank you, Mr. Humphreys. My Lord, uh, that is the case for the prosecution. I call the accused, Stephen Benson. Stephen Benson, did you on July the 27th attack Officer Parker? No, sir, don't go around whacking screws. I beg your pardon, Benson. Uh, my lord, I'm afraid we're going to experience some difficulty during my client's testimony. His language is heavily sprinkled with prison slang and London colloquialism. I see. Well, Mr Elliot, perhaps between us we can make sure that the jury have some idea of what the accused is talking about. I do hope so, lord. I believe that he just remarked that he does not go around hitting prison officers. I'm obliged. Uh, Benson. Earlier in this trial, <clears throat> excuse me, your criminal record was read out. Now, all of the crimes of which you have been found guilty throughout your young life appear to be non-violent ones. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I just do a bit of screwing now and again. You mean you've been a prison officer? <laughs> no, me lad. Screwing. Breaking and entering, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you, my lord. Now, you heard Governor Humphreys testify that apart from this business of your letters, You've not caused him any trouble. Now, have you caused any trouble during any of your previous prison terms? No, sir. I always do me bird quietly. You have never been violent in prison? Yes, what I said. For this lot, I've never been in the chokey. Now, you've heard allegations made by your former cellmate, one Mr Hudson. What do you have to say about them? That little nonsense, no mate of mine. That's what he said. He should be done for perjury. I, I believe the word nonce, my lord, is what the inmates refer to as sexual offenders. Thank you, sir. Now, Stephen, this present sentence that you're serving, now, apart from your girlfriend, is there anyone else that you see on visits or that you write to? Well, no, sir. That's what gets so aggravated when they do a number on me letters. I thought about shoving out a stiff. I changed my mind. I didn't want to get into trouble. Benson, what is a stiff? A bent letter. One that's been smuggled out the nicks. Ah, thank you. Now, would you please tell the court in your own words what happened when you returned from the welfare office to workshop three on July the 27th. Well, I didn't get any satisfaction out of the welfare. That's why I told her I was going to have him. No. Parker, that is. What do you mean, you were going to have him? That I was going to the AG, make a complaint about him. The AG being the assistant governor? Of course. Well, the red band took me back to the workshop, and Parker came in so the other screw could go to tea. So I had a go at Parker. Now, 
What do you mean you had a go at him? I told him what I thought of him. They'd been taking liberties of me. Let's go on. Well, he said, go back and get on with your work, you ignorant bastard. So I did. I stopped for a chat with a mate on the way, wanted to know how I got on at the welfare. I was telling him when I heard Parker cry out. I turned round and he was lying there on the floor. On the floor? Did, did you see anyone hit him? No, sir. I ran over to see what was the matter. He was hurt bad. Somebody other con said I should sit down and leave him alone, but I couldn't leave him like that. It was blood everywhere. So I ran and pressed the alarm bell and then I went back to see what I could... Just, just one minute. Are you saying that it was you that rang the alarm bell? Of course. He was bleeding to death. I ran and pressed the bell, then I went back to see what I could do for him. I was kneeling beside him when those two came storming in. That bastard axe come at me like a tank. He was clubbing me and kicking me all over the place. Some of the others started to give out with shouts and then everything went black. Next thing I remember is that nutter throwing me in the chokey. Then he come in and started kicking me again. He kicked the shit out of me. Members of this story, this touching story of yours about your concern for Parker, you don't really expect my lord and the jury to believe it, do you? Well, it's the truth. Well, here is this man whom you clearly disliked, a man whom you had told the welfare officer you were going to have, a man who said you were threatened to crack like an egg. Here is this man, and you run to help him. It's an absurd story. You're twisting my words. I never said I was going to crack his head. Your cellmate, Hudson, has sworn that you threatened to. Yeah, the little lance is lying. And that is exactly what happened, is it not? He did get his head cracked like an egg, didn't he? Not by me, he didn't. Come now. You were caught by these two officers with the hammer in your hand. I was lying on the floor. It probably dropped off the workbench for all I know. Oh, really? Just as Officer Parker, if we are to believe your defence, just as he fell on the floor. Look, all I know is I didn't hit him. I don't go around hitting people. It's not my scene. Officer Turner has testified that you threatened him. The prison governor has testified that, while serving prison sentences, you did on two separate occasions threaten officers. Hardly passive behaviour, is it? Oh, just threats when I was wound up. I wouldn't hit anyone. It's stupid. Yes, well, I put it to you that this story of yours is not merely stupid, but that it is a fabrication, a fantasy. And that there is not one word of truth in it. I'm telling the truth. I'm on oath to do that. Yes. Just as you were on a number of occasions in the past, evidently those juries did not believe you either. My Lord, I must have uh, Mr. Lattimore, that was an unwarranted personal attack. It's all right, Governor. I can give him his answer. Can you now? I should like to hear it. Every time I've been done before, I've pleaded guilty, so it hasn't been a case for juries. You should know that, my lord. You sent me away for the sentence I'm serving at the moment. I did? Yes, sir. You sure? Yes, sir. Ulchester Crown Court, August the 14th, 1974. I did indeed. Now, why didn't you mention this earlier? You could have had a different trial judge. I'm happy with the one I got. I thought he was very fair to me last time. I don't know, I'm sure. Are you certain you have no objection to my sitting on this case? You are at liberty to discuss this with your counsel, if you wish. There's no need, I'm happy. Mr Lattimore, Mr Elliot, in view of the fact that I've dealt with this man previously, do either of you have any application? Uh, no, my lord. No, my lord. Very well. Let us continue. I have no further questions, my lord. Thank you, Stephen. Call Mr Anthony Mills, please. Mr. Mills, is the accused known to you? Yeah, we were sharing the same cell at the time of the trouble. I'm not known to you, am I, Mr. Mills? No, I haven't had that pleasure, my lord. No. Thank you, my lord. By trouble, you mean... Uh, what they call the riot. I've been in isolation since then. Did you ask to be put in isolation? Oh, of course not. It was Governor's orders. He slapped about 20 of us into isolation after the trouble. And we're still there. But that's six months ago. That's right. And we'll be there until the committee inquiring into the riot decides to finish inquiring. Now, the night before the riot, do you recall the conversations that took place in your cell? Yes, I do. <laughs> it's been alleged by one witness that Benson made a number of threatening remarks that evening whilst in the cell. Do you recall those? Nah, he never threatened anybody. Wouldn't hurt a fly, that one. Did you hear him at any time during the entire night make any kind of threats towards Officer Parker? No, the only thing he said about Parker that night was he was going to see the AG and complain about the way his letters were being censored. 
No threats to hit the officer, Officer Parker, over the head with a hammer. But Ivy Benson, you must be joking. He's not a GBH merchant, he's just a tea leaf. He just does his bird nice and quietly and never causes any trouble to the heavy mob. They don't even bother to spin his Peter. Oh dear, here we go again. Uh, Mr. Mills, it would greatly assist proceedings if we could maintain at least a nodding acquaintance with the Queen's English. Oh, certainly. I'm sorry, my lord. I was merely stating that Benson there is not a violent criminal. He's just a thief. He's never caused any trouble in prison, not even with those officers who go out looking for it. And they don't even bother to search his cell. Is that better? I'm much obliged. Well, no. uh, anticipating that my learned friend will wish to inquire into your past, uh, Mr. Mills, would you mind telling us what you're in prison for? Kiting. I've got three years. Oh, that's uh, passing false checks, my lord. Thank you. Now, prior to the riot, where did you work in the prison? Uh, same place as Stevie, Workshop 3. And were you in the work Workshop 3 on July the 27th of this year? Yes, I was. And were you in Workshop 3 when the accused returned from the welfare office? Yes. Now, would you please tell the court what happened? Well, he came back and he had a bit of a row with Parker about his letters being stopped. And uh, Parker told him to shut up and get back to work. So I called Stevie over to ask him how he got on with the welfare. Well, we were having a bit of a bunny when uh, suddenly Parker lets out a yell. I thought at first he was rucking Stevie for talking. And then Stevie runs over to where Parker had collapsed on the floor and he presses the alarm bell. And, and that animal accident comes roaring in and starts kicking Stevie all over the place and belting him with his truncheon. Then he drags Stevie outside. Oh, by that time, things had started to get a little bit heavy in the workshop. You know, there was uh, chairs flying about and there was a couple of windows got broke and, uh, well, there was a fire. <coughs> And now they're deciding which of us to charge with writing. Mr. Mills, I thank you. Mr. Mills, <clears throat> bouncing checks is not the total extent of your criminal record, is it? No, I've got a record longer than your wig. And before you ask, it's a violent one, all right? Yes. So now, um, this is not the first prison riot in which you have been involved, is it? No, and it probably won't be the last. As long as the screws treat us like wild animals, we'll act like wild animals. Mm. Green Tree Prison, 1973. You tried to form a prisoner's union then, did you not? Yes, I did. Yes, the result was a riot costing this country half a million pounds, was it not? That's right, I did it all on my own. I don't be bloody stupid. We were protesting about the brutality in that nick. About the food not fit for pigs. Do you know that proportionately they spend more money feeding the guard dogs in this country's nicks than they do on a con's food? Anyway, why shouldn't prisoners be members of a union? I am not here, Mr. Mills, to debate with you your extraordinary ideas, nor am I here to answer your questions. You are here to answer mine now. The riot in Green Tree Prison began when you hit a prison officer, did it not? No, that riot in Green Tree Prison began 150 years ago when they built the place. And the screws they had there in 1973 still thought in terms of treadmills and picking oakum. Not even the dustbins were chained together like they are in Parkhurst. Hit a screw. You bet I hit him, and I'll tell you why. The I reason am I hit him. interested in why. My lord, can I finish my answer? Yes, Mills, you may. I hit him because he put carbolic acid in the fish tank in my cell and killed my fish. Now, he didn't do that to punish me or because I've been a naughty boy. Now, it was a warning. Stop going on about prisoners' rights or else. He was trying to wind me up to get me at it. Well, he succeeded. I did over 500 days solitary confinement after that. That's nearly two years. Alone in a cell, 23 hours a day. Oh, they let you out for an hour a day so you don't forget how to walk. In 1972, you staged a sit-down strike at Garfield Prison, is that right? I staged a sit-down strike in protest at the work they had us doing. We spent every working day making chair legs. And when we made them, they burnt them in the prison furnace. That's how they get at you. I don't listen to all this crap about rehabilitation. Nobody wants to rehabilitate us. Why should they? Well, if they did, they'd all be out of work. Come to think of it, you'd all be out of work as well. Mills, just now you remarked that at Green Tree you were held in solitary confinement for over 500 days. You sure it was that long? Yes, my lord. That's by no means the record. Timothy Noonan had over a thousand days solitary before the press got hold of it. The late Timothy Noonan, I should say. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So that's more. My lord. <clears throat> Mr. Mills, how would you sum up your attitude to prison officers? In a word, hatred. 
for what they've done to me and what they're doing to others. Yes, you hate them enough to come into that box and to lie about them, don't you? Oh, do me a favour. I don't have to lie about them. Just tell the truth. Well, I suggest that there is not one word of truth in your account of the attack on Officer Parker. I suggest that it is a tissue of lies. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I am here to guide you in matters of fact, of truth, you are the sole judges. Now, did the accused, Stephen Benson, make a brutal attack on a prison officer, resulting, as we've heard, in that officer becoming little more than a living vegetable? This case has a number of unusual features, not least of which is the amount of tainted evidence. By that, I mean evidence which has come from dubious quarters. In his final speech to you, prosecuting counsel rightly drew your attention, not only to the record of the accused, but also to the record of the witness Mills. You will consider what he said. You will also consider defense counsel's remarks concerning the witness Hudson. I would like you now to retire, elect a foreman, and consider your verdict. All stand. <laughs> Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Have at least ten of you reached a verdict upon which you are all agreed? Yes. Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Stephen Benson. The verdict is one of not guilty. You are free to leave this court and return to Fulchester Prison. All stand. <laughs>